Welcome to Fireside Chats. I am Will Fenton, the Director of Scholarly Innovation here at the Library Company of Philadelphia. We are America's first subscription library, Benjamin Franklin's Library, and today we support all sorts of terrific researchers. And that's really what the Fireside Chats are all about. It's about opening up a web-based platform. We have a weekly webinar series here where we turn it over to our current and former fellows. And they talk about all the wonderful things that they're doing whether it's a book project or a digital humanities project or a work in progress like we'll hear about tonight. Um, so a couple of, you know, just notes about how this whole thing goes down. This is a webinar structure. Um, so that means that participation is limited, but it's still available. Um, so if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little button with a Q and A. I want to encourage you as you're listening to Adam's talk tonight, if you have a question, you have an idea, you have something you want to follow up on, write it as soon as you come to you, uh, or as soon as it comes to you in that Q&A feature, because what I'll do is I'll try to work through those sequentially once we get to the Q&A section. Um, and that really is the easiest way for us to organize um, that kind of participation. The other thing that I will note is that if I have any bright ideas about digital resources that I think would be valuable, I will use the chat functionality to pass those along to you. And of course, if I don't have any bright ideas, we can still follow up after the fact and share those with you because all of you have registered with your email. So we'll be following up in the next week or so with not just some session notes uh, so you can continue learning, but also links to static versions of this. Meaning if you wanna be able to share the video from this, we'll have it up on YouTube in the next week or so. Um, tip of the hat to Deja Brock, who does all the editing and, ed and, um, and um, uploading work on that with Emily Smith. And um, of course, we'll also have it available as a podcast, thanks to the hard work of Anne McShane, our podcast editor. So we're now doing our podcast, Talking to the Library, on a weekly basis. So we've expedited our schedule to meet this demand. Um, so don't worry about taking scrupulous notes. We, we want you to kick up your slippered feet have a glass of wine and enjoy this um, hour long uh, chat. So uh, one last call to action. If you like what you hear, uh, consider signing up for our email list. That's easy to find. You just go to librarycompany.org and right at the bottom of the screen, you can sign up for our email and then you hear about all the other wonderful things that we're doing. So. With that, I wanna introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Adam Latz is professor of education and history at Binghamton University, State University of New York. He completed his PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2007. He's the author of several books, including Fundamentalist You, Keeping the Faith in American Higher Education from Oxford University Press 2018, and The Other School Reformers, Conservative Activism in American Education, Harvard University Press 2015. Clearly very shy about getting into politics there. Um, Dr. Latz was a short-term McNeil Fellow at the Library Company during the month of June 2019, so just about a year ago. That's mm -hmm. great. Uh, so with that, let me turn over the reins to Dr. Latz. All right. Well, thank you very much, Will, um, and thanks, everybody. I, um, I was going to say thanks for, for coming, uh, but um, we don't go places anymore. Thanks and for, um, for taking the time to be here. I, I uh, was able to dig up a, a fireside background for the fireside chat. I, um, I was even uh, excited to have a chance to put on a tie. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to be able to talk with you. As, as Will mentioned, uh, I'm working, uh, starting the writing of a book um, about Joseph Lancaster. And what I'd like to share with you tonight from my research, including, as Will mentioned, um, uh, work last summer at the library company and next door at the historical society as well. Um, what I'd like to share with you tonight is a sort of a 20-year puzzle about um, Joseph Lancaster. Um, sorry, I'm just putting my screen up. So a 20-year puzzle being from 1818 to 1838. And in 1818, uh, Joseph Lancaster was invited to come from London, where he had started his famous school, to New York. And when he arrived, he was treated like a total... 1818 rock star. I mean, um, the, the, he was squired off on a fancy, like special chartered ferry boat up the Hudson River from New York City up to Albany, he, where he met the governor, he met the, all the state um, government. Uh, Joseph Lancaster, he gave a speech in his first few months in the United States, he gave a speech to the US Congress, um, where he laid out his plan for fixing um, 
schools, making schools that would work for, for America's cities. Um, his ideas were actually made into law in places like Philadelphia, for example, Baltimore too in a few years. So that's 1818. Uh, by 1838 though, 20 years later, Joseph Lancaster was dead. Um, and he died really ugly. He stepped out in New York City, stepped out in front of a horse carriage, and it uh, crushed his skull, killed him instantly. And uh, we'll, he was 61. Uh, we'll never know uh, for sure, obviously, what went on in those final moments. Um, it could, he could have just accidentally stepped out in front of the carriage. Um, we don't know that. We do know that by the time he did it, his reputation had been destroyed. Um, he was fleeing from city to city because of all the debt that he owed. He never um, sad, satisfactorily answered um, these accusations that chased him from London, that he sexually abused his students and teachers. Um, cities like Philadelphia no longer used his plan. So something happened uh, between 1818 and 1838, and that's the question I'd like to address tonight. And I'll start by saying uh, not as many people, uh, people like, you know, Johann Neem uh, know who Yo Joseph Lancaster is, but normal people don't. Um, there's no, well, your town might have a Horace Mann Elementary School. I looked, there are no towns that have a Joseph Lancaster Elementary School. These days, he's not very well known, but when he died, and, and throughout the, the first part of the 1800s, he was one of the most famous people in the world. Uh, and this is one of his um, obituaries. And as it says, I think it's true, few men have attained more celebrity than Joseph Lancaster. But we fear that his latter days were clouded by misfortune. And both halves of that are um, true. And both halves of that help us get into this mystery of um, what happened during these 20 years. Uh, the um, celebrity of Joseph Lancaster uh, is hard to uh, under overestimate. Uh, he was um, this world famous character, uh, world famous for his plan. But what I'd like to do tonight is both look at why he was so well beloved in 1818 in the US, and then why by 1838, no one answered his letters anymore. No one really cared about him anymore. And to do so, I want to back up a little bit to um, explore the way Americans um, in the decades following the revolution, the way Americans in those decades tended to think about children and especially about children and cities. Uh, you, you may, uh, Thomas Jefferson was maybe the most famous uh, urban skeptic in those years. And a lot of Americans, especially elite Americans shared this fear that growing up in cities, children growing up in cities wouldn't grow up healthy. They wouldn't have um, the same sort of Republican virtue that uh, the young new American nation needed to keep itself going. Uh, and I, I, let me share with you a couple of examples. The first is from, uh, he was the mayor at the time of New York City, DeWitt Clinton. And in 1809, he told a group of philanthropists about his worries for um, children in the city. As he put it, a number of benevolent persons had seen with concern the increasing vices of the city arising in a great degree from the neglected education of the poor. And this is the money phrase. Great cities are at all times the nurseries and hotbeds of crime. Uh, and Dwight Clinton obviously was just one person, um, but this sentiment that America's cities in the early years of the 1800s were incredibly dangerous places, especially for children, was uh, very widespread and in a very palpable fear. Uh, now historians know that um, the cities of the 18, uh, you know, 18 aughts and 1810s and 1820s, they didn't yet have the sort of throngs of immigrants that came later, the 1840s and then again in the end part of the 1800s. But people like DeWitt Clinton uh, didn't obviously they didn't know what was going to happen in the 1840s at the time they felt like their cities like New York was uh, bursting with um, low income no income uh, uh, children who were 
um, learning terrible lessons. The danger in the minds of people like DeWitt Clinton wasn't that kids on the streets weren't getting an education. The danger, as, as Mayor Clinton said here, was that cities were doing a great job of educating children. Cities were nurseries, but they were the nurseries of crime. Uh, so let me just share uh, another example, if I may. Um, this, there was a series of books at the time, uh, Cries of the City. So this is from Cries of Philadelphia, which was from 1810. It was a, a, a ripoff of the Cries of New York, um, which was published the year before, which was a ripoff of the Cries of London. But this was a series of children's books where um, it would take you on a, the book was supposed to take you on a little trip of the city. Um, and you would hear the, the cries that you would hear in the city. So here on this page, um, you see the match girl and you hear her cry. Do you want any matches? Um, the, the lesson from this genre of children's book that was popular in the early years of the 1800s in cities like New York and Philadelphia and London was that children like this, and you see how she's uh, portrayed. She's got the ragged dress, she's barefoot, um, and she's trying to make money in the street. And the, the anxiety that this was um, pandering to was widely shared among elite urban groups in Philadelphia and in other cities. Um, the message is unmistakable. Children growing up here without, uh, without money, without family money, they wouldn't lack an education, but the education that they'd get uh, the commonly used word was in vice and crime. And the vice for a girl, the implication always was that if you can't make money selling matches, which you can't, uh, you may be forced to turn to other um, uh, things, the implication always being sex work or prostitution for girls, thievery for boys. Um, and this feeling was palpable in the writings of uh, reformers uh, in cities throughout the period. And what I'm suggesting is uh, that this feeling is partly what led to the reception that Joseph Lancaster received in 1818. Uh, first, we should note that um, cities like New York and Philadelphia and Boston, it's not that they didn't have schools at the time, they did. Um, and they had, uh, the, you know, the terms that we use, public and private, don't really work. Um, schools where parents paid tuition, so we'd think of them as private schools, uh, they often sometimes also got uh, government funding. And similarly, um, schools that were operated by charities, pub, you know, private institutions also often got money from government. It was, it was mixed up at the era. But there was a lot of schooling. One of the specific uh, anxieties was the schooling that was available for families that couldn't pay any tuition at all. And there were schools uh, for them run by churches, often called charity schools. Um, but generally they were considered not to have enough capacity to, to handle all these throngs of match girls and um, other kids that were thronging the streets of cities like Philadelphia. And it's this environment that led reformers in places like New York and Philadelphia to invite London's hero, Joseph Lancaster in 1818 to come over. Um, so who was Joseph Lancaster? Well, um, in, he was a monster, <laughs> first of all. Uh, when I started this project, I was aware generally of Joseph Lancaster and his role in the history of education. But I kind of thought he would be like a sort of naive, maybe, um, you know, a, a well-meaning do-gooder. Um, but the better I got to know him in places like the Library Company and the Historical Society and in Worcester at the American Antiquarian Society, um, he had this experience that I think um, made him just a really, really terrible person. So for example, this is the experience. Uh, when he's 23 years old, he started a school in London. Um, and in 1798, he started uh, he noticed that kids couldn't all come to his school if they couldn't afford tuition. So he started a subscription, you know, getting donations for kids who couldn't afford it, their families couldn't afford it, to attend his school. Um, and he had some innovative methods that we'll talk about in a minute, some of which he stole, some of which he made up. Um, but what happened to him when he was a young man 
uh, I think he ended up being a, sort of like a child star of the era. Um, he got too much celebrity too young. Um, he got, a, the, he attracted the attention. So this is 1790s uh, in London. He attracted the attention of two dukes. And these dukes uh, became famous, you know, Kardashian level sponsors of um, Joseph Lancaster's Borough Road School. Uh, Lancaster, even through the Dukes, was able to meet the king and get a royal seal of approval for his school. So he was able to call his school the Royal Borough Road School. And at the time, this is a huge honor. Um, it's a huge, you know, leap into sort of the, the spotlight. And he attracted it because he organized his school in a slightly different way. He created what he always called, the words he tended to use was, this was his system. And I'd like to describe the system uh, for you now so you can get a sense of what was so exciting to the New Yorkers and the Philadelphians and the Londoners who went and visited these schools. Um, so the most um, eye-catching innovation was um, his use of teachers. Uh, famously, Joseph Lancaster got rid of adult teachers. Instead of uh, the tradition of having an adult teacher who would listen to students' recitations, Lancaster had one adult for a whole large room full of students, but that one adult would be the, the teacher, the term that they used at the time usually was master, one schoolmaster. But as you can see in this um, uh, picture, the teaching would be done by monitors, children. Uh, so the, the little guy standing in front is only a little older than the children that he's teaching. And uh, this is from the library company's collection. The library company, by the way, has a fantastic collection of Lancaster's manuals. Uh, they were, in the era, they were published um, in, uh, by the Reams. There's a London edition, there's New York editions, there's Philadelphia editions. This one is from the London 1810 edition and all the little children are learning to write, and the monitor, the other child teacher, is reviewing their writing. Uh, since it's the London edition, their little slates say, I know you can't see it from, from your computer, but they all say, God save the king. And in the, in the New York edition, it's politely rubbed out, and it, it, it doesn't say anything on their, slide, on their slates. But the big innovation of Lancaster schools was to get rid of teachers that you had to pay, employ these monitors that you didn't have to pay, and they would instruct other children in the basics. Here they're learning to write. Here they're learning to read. And in these reading circles, Lancaster, instead of having expensive books, one book per student, they, he put the books on uh, placards on the wall so the groups of 10 or 12 students could all read. And you can see the monitors are the slightly taller boys you know, uh, pointing to the, the text. And they would have the students read aloud. Uh, by the way, one of the unsatisfying parts of my research, I have not been able to solve this mystery. The rumor of Lancastrian um, fans uh, was that the phrase toe the line came from what you're looking at right now. Because you see the students would all have to stand a certain way, hands behind their back clasped and their toes on the line. Um, so some uh, um, fans of the system and early historians said that the phrase toe the line came from Lancastrian schools. Other historians say, no, it's a British naval term. So um, I haven't been able to get a satisfying answer to whether or not that term really comes from uh, these Lancastrian schools. But this is the big innovation of Lancastrian methods. Instead of expensive teachers, you have free or you know, super cheap uh, students who are teaching other students. But those weren't the only innovations. Uh, Lancaster promised that his, he had a better building as well. So this is a sketch um, from a, a, a supporter of Lancaster of the school he wanted to, to, in, to build in their town of Halifax. Um, and you can see a Lancastrian school building or a school room, I guess, would be one large open room. And in this image that you're looking at, the teacher's desk, the adult teacher's desk is far away on the right. And you'd have an upward sloping floor and you'd have all the students and all the monitors all in the same room. You could have multiple big rooms, but you wouldn't have classrooms the way we think about it. Uh, here's another sketch. Now the teacher's desk is at the other side. Students would sit at these long uh, benches. 
and, and they, would, they would be sloping up from the starting students all the way to the most advanced in the back. And they would physically, like an auditorium seating, it would slope up. So ideally the master, the um, teacher could see everyone. These little semicircles along the side, those would be for the reading circles that you saw earlier. So that the um, monitors could take their little groups and they could go uh, to do their reading, then they could go back to their seats and do their writing and their math. Um, so there's, um, there's a pedagogical change of having children. There's uh, the school building change. There's also all kinds of technological gimmicks that Lancaster was very fond of. Uh, this is a sketch from his, um, one of his journals. He was a, a, an energetic sketcher. And uh, he calls these the reading, um, reading sticks, where he would hope that they could save money by, um, instead of, uh, thanks Janine, uh, I can't type though. Um, uh, instead of, um, you know, having one book, they could share the book. Uh, and Lancaster loved coming up with these machines. Uh, he came up, this is from a New York edition of his guidebook, um, where he'd have the alphabet wheel. You have the bench with holes for hats. Joseph Lancaster I, seemed obsessed with hats. Uh, and he came up with all these solutions for what students can do with their hats. In the end, by the 1820s, he liked this bench with holes for hats approach. So that students wouldn't waste time. They'd come right in and they'd put their hat right underneath their seat. Um, so the, the buildings, the technology, the child teachers, uh, one additional reform that Lancaster pushed was in terms of punishment. Lancaster said um, he, he was opposed to physical, physical punishment, corporal punishment was out. What he did instead sounds um, harsh to our ears, but uh, it was considered to be a, a kinder, gentler sort of punishment. Uh, Lancaster schools uh, relied on emotional public humiliation. So the worst of all, the worst punishment of all was uh, the basket. Uh, there's all kinds of methods that Lancaster recommended. The worst was the basket. Um, if a student, and, and by the way, it says boys, uh, but Lancaster schools sometimes were mixed boys and girls. Uh, usually there would be one room for boys and a separate room for girls. Uh, they were generally segregated by race as well. But as we'll see in a minute, um, uh, a lot of times, like in New York, for example, they'd had, they had a separate um, school for uh, African-American students. Uh, so here, though, <laughs> the punishment would be to take the kid, put them in a basket, and yoink the basket, like dangle the basket from the roof of the school, the big building. All the other students were supposed to point and laugh. Like that was the idea. The idea was to be humiliated. Um, and it, as he, as he says in this little clip, um, it was so terrible, uh, that no one would even need to use it because it was so terrible. Uh, let's get to, to Janine's question. Um, oh, and as we'll see, how did they choose monitors? What training would those monitors, uh, receive? Uh, this becomes in, in New York, especially, but in Philadelphia as well, this becomes a huge point of contention. The monitor choice was made by, um, by the teacher. Um, a student would get to be a monitor by um, showing good behavior, by being sort of the top of the class, and you could get bumped. So if, if anyone else came up after you, they could become monitor and you could lose your job at any second. Lancaster thought that this was the key to sort of keeping everybody um, working as hard as they possibly could. And so, to be fair, some um, visitors to the, his original Borough Road School they thought it really worked. Uh, but as we'll see, often it also didn't. Now, uh, some of the problems that came out, as we'll see, have to do with the system. But others had to do with um, uh, Lancaster himself. As I mentioned earlier, he was a different person than I thought he'd be. He was, um, had this vision of himself as a sort of world historic genius who deserved to be rich and to be treated special. So uh, when his career started in London, as his fame grew, he started going on um, 
making lectures and going on speaking tours in Ireland, Scotland, all around England. And he had a habit of asking for money and taking money. So one thing would be he would ask wealthy people to subscribe, to give money to his Borough Road School, or to subscribe to start a, a local school, or to do a loan and so that uh, Lancaster could get funding for any one of these school projects that he was promising to build. He promised to build a lot of schools all over England and Scotland and Wales. The problem was he, uh, Lancaster, when he got money, he took it, he put it in his pocket. He didn't keep receipts. He spent it. Um, he, he went into huge debt uh, and he wasn't keeping track of how much money he owed. And he had very little reliable income. It was just sort of money given to him here and there. And publicly, um, he had the bad habit of spending a lot of money in ways that looked really obvious to everybody in London. So most famously, he would hire a carriage to drive around in a very expensive carriage to drive him around. And he would bring kids from his school, you know, kids from low income families to drive around in this very expensive carriage. Now, um, Obviously, at least to me, it seems obvious. If your business is educating the urban poor, driving around spending donated money willy nilly on luxury goods isn't like the best public image. And that's what happens in Lancaster's case. So by 1808, Lancaster can no longer hide from all this debt that he has been piling up. Uh, he, his creditors are demanding payment or demanding that he start selling uh, some of these, uh, so, like his schools and the, the things that went into making his schools, like at Borough Road in London. So a group of his, um, I was going to say friends, uh, but he didn't really have friends. He had admirers or enemies. So a group of his admirers, people who admired this system for uh, educating poor children, they finally forced him to sit down and tally up his debt. And so all told in 1808, it turned out that Lancaster was 6,500 pounds in debt. Uh, and for context, um, a, a well-off sort of high-end teacher at the time would earn 400 or maybe 500 pounds a year in, in um, London and other English towns. So uh, by, con you know, by uh, today's standards, He's somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, 650,000, maybe a million dollars in debt or the equivalent thereof. And he has no income. He has no money. He has some assets that were put into the school. He doesn't own them. Um, he doesn't, it's very unclear. His finances are very unclear and he's hugely in debt. So what to do? This group of supporters forced him and it wasn't easy. They forced him to agree to this deal they would take over the day-to-day -day running of the school. They would take over the finances. He would keep going with a salary as like a teacher, um, but he was no longer allowed to ask for money or to take money from people because that's how he got in so much trouble. Uh, so long story short, it didn't work out. Lancaster refused to go by these rules. He refused to stop taking money from uh, rich strangers and he kept going more and more into debt. And he, oh, and he wouldn't teach at the school either. Um, he insisted that he was, you know, too good for um, just teaching. He wanted to be just the genius. So one of his one of his supporters at the time, Joseph Hume, later wrote his memory of Lancaster during these negotiations, and and uh, this again was one of Lancaster's friends. And as he put it, in many instances, Lancaster's behavior has been so extraordinary that I begin to suspect the soundness of his intellects, um, and that was the, one of the kinder statements from this group of people who were dealing with him in the 18 teens in um, London. So it's this environment when Lancaster receives the invitation from New York to come to New York and to um, import his system into American cities like New York, uh, New York City. And it was the same time that Pennsylvania passes a law that created the first school district, uh, which includes Philadelphia. And it mandated, it legally mandated that, that those first schools would be run according to Lancastrian principles. People in Philly uh, and in New York had these enormously high hopes because they had been so afraid of what would happen to urban children with low incomes. 
and they had heard such great things from London, from the Dukes, from the Kings, from the celebrities who endorsed Lancaster's system, and of course from Lancaster himself, the man was writing and publishing about how awesome his school was. So they invited him over, uh, and it's almost too easy uh, to predict now what went wrong. Um, first of all, before we get to Lancaster's personal problems, um, the system just didn't work. Uh, I, I wanna share uh, two examples, one from students and one from teachers. So from students, uh, New York, as I mentioned, had a segregated African American school. They called it the African Free School. And it was run on Lancastrian principles. And parents objected to the way, for one thing, to the way their students, their children were being disciplined. So I think it's the 1820s, it's New York, and you have a school where African American students, to be punished, one of the punishments was, instead of being beaten, they would be shackled ankle to ankle, uh, misbehaving students, one student to another, and forced to march backwards around the outside of that big school building, the school, I mean, in the inside, the big school room, while monitors would loudly announce whatever they did wrong, you know, showed up, was, was disrespectful, didn't finish his reading. So parents, African-American parents in New York in the 1820s weren't keen um, on this kind of punishment. It just, it reeked of, you know, the slave system in the United States at the time. And Joseph Lancaster, um, you know, instead of apologizing and changing, he reacted angrily and said, you know, I'm a Quaker, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm an abolitionist, what are you talking about? Uh, so as a result of that and other complaints, um, African American students uh, in New York just stopped coming. So by 1827, for example, um, there was supposed to, there was an estimated 2,500 African American uh, youth in the city at the time that were eligible to go to this school, but only 600 went, and that's even given at the time um, African American uh, reformers had a program. They were going door to door trying to get parents to bring their kids to the school, and parents didn't want to do it. They said it was too much. You know, the punishments were too much like slavery. Uh, so that's one problem in one of the schools, but it was typical of the kinds of problems that went on. The schools didn't work the way they were advertised. Parents didn't like it. Students didn't like it. Teachers also didn't like it. So uh, in the in the 18 teens in New York, for example, the free school society, the people who ran the Lancastrian schools, they had a real problem because these um, children, 14 years old, 15 years old, after they taught as monitors for a while, they would leave to go work either as private tutors or they would go to work in private, you know, privately run schools, entrepreneurial schools. And so they could, the free school society couldn't keep these teachers, these children working um, as free, as teachers for free because they could get paid elsewhere. And one of the things that they pondered in 1818 was to maybe force all the children, all the monitors, to accept um, indentured servant status. So legally at the time, they could sign on and they wouldn't be able to leave until they were 21 and they would work in exchange for learning how to teach in the system. But that didn't work either because the teachers of any age could simply leave and get paid elsewhere. Why would they sign an indenture? Uh, and, and they did it. But it, it's a sign of how in practice, neither the students often, or the teachers weren't happy with this system. So by the 1820s, cities like New York, um, cities like Philadelphia, cities like Baltimore, uh, were moving toward the system that we're more familiar with, uh, the outlines of it. A teacher, an adult teacher, for every group of kids, set off in a separate classroom space. So um, the, the things that started happening were uh, they started training more teachers in normal schools, and they started cutting up the school buildings from the big open buildings into what we think of as classrooms. Uh, and that happened over time, but it starts in this period when Lancastrian system is seen as inadequate for what they, what, what they wanted, which was schooling for everyone. What about Lancaster himself? And I'll do this quickly. Uh, it wasn't pretty. Um, he, just like he did in London, he kept getting into more and more debt. 
Um, and he never recognized the fact that he should play by the rules. He always thought he'd get one big score, one huge payoff, and he'd be able to pay off all his debt. So that left him uh, running, uh, fleeing uh, from New York to Philadelphia, to Baltimore, to Boston, and every city he eventually has to leave because he's in too much debt. The saddest part of the whole thing was uh, surprising in that by 1826, um, he is, has run from all these cities and he gets an invite from uh, General Simon Bolivar, uh, the, the um, South American um, uh, general who uh, helped lead the fight against the Spanish in Latin America. And General Bolivar says, hey, um, famous Joseph Lancaster, come to Caracas, set us up a new national system of schools, we'll pay you 10,000 American dollars. And Bolivar, I mean, I assume just got lucky, but that was the most perfect thing you could say to Lancaster to get him to do whatever you wanted. It was the big payoff that Lancaster had always dreamed of. So he moves with his family down to Caracas and he kind of sets up some schools, but mostly, and his files are full of these letters like the one I'm showing you now, they might be the saddest thing I've ever seen in any archive. It's, um, he writes every day, sometimes twice a day, to Bolivar's office saying, when can I get the money? Will I soon get the money? Have you sent the money? Uh, you say you've sent the money, but I don't see the money. When can I have the money? And it just goes on and on until he realizes he's not getting the money. And so he leaves again because he's built up debts in Caracas. And this time he flees to Montreal. So by the time he gets to Montreal, he's writing these subscriptions that no one is reading. In Montreal, he writes these pleas saying, I've got a new system, a better system, but no one's listening. Because what Lancaster had done inadvertently is set up an impossible situation for himself. If his system worked, then it didn't need him. It didn't need any genius, anybody could do it. If it didn't work, which it didn't, then they didn't need him either because who needs the inventor of a system that doesn't work? So by 1838, he visits New York, again, looking for money. And we don't know what happened that morning. We'll never know. Um, he, we know he stepped out in front of this horse carriage, killed instantly. We do know at that point that he had alienated all of his supporters in multiple countries, in multiple cities. Um, he had uh, alienated his daughter, his wife, his new wife. Um, he was deeply in debt. He had never escaped the charges of sexual abuse that had plagued him since his London days. And he always thought that he just wasn't recognized as this world genius who needs to get paid. So in the end, Joseph Lancaster had dreamed that his system was gonna be the thing that would fix the problems of urban poverty in one quick generation. I think he really thought that, uh, but he was, just plain wrong. Uh, neither his system nor Lancaster himself ended up surviving past the 1830s. So thank you. I've tried to keep it short, but I kept talking too long. But I'd love to hear if there's any more questions, comments, anything. Thank you so much, Adam. That was My great. Um, while folks are thinking about questions they might want to ask, I want to start with sort of a very elementary question as somebody who's not an educational historian. Um, aside from inculcating young students with Republican virtue, what was the, the, the role of education in 1825? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one of the knocks on, on um, the Lancastrian education was that it was too basic. Uh, you know, it was supposed to be just reading, writing, and basic math, and, and uh, basic religion and behavior and stuff. Um, but it really depends. Uh, so for um, affluent city goers or city um, residents um, who had, you know, enough money to pay for tuition schools, uh, the, the sort of what the high school level education would include um, trades kind of stuff. So it wouldn't be unusual for a young boy who's in his teens, uh, who has his family has money to yes, you learn the basics. Um, you, uh, if you're not planning to go to college, you would learn sort of a trade like surveying, for example. And you would learn that at the high school level, the plan being that you would then be able to 
be a surveyor or navigation was another sort of um, career skill that was taught at the sort of academy or high school level. So it very much depends on, um, uh, in terms of the curriculum, it depends on who you are. Um, but uh, it, Lancastrian schools got knocked for being too basic. Some people use Lancastrian methods though and taught all those sort of high school level professions. Well, for girls, it was sewing and dancing and music mm. often. So we have um, the tease of a question from Dee Andrews, one of our regular participants, which I know is coming. But in the meantime, we have a question from Johan Neem, who thanks you for an amazing talk and asks, what interested you about the Lancaster? Uh, or what interested you about Lancaster initially? Are there lessons for the discussions we're having today about reforming urban public education? God bless you, Johan. Thanks for coming. Uh, yes, in fact, um, the original, my original interest in Lancastrian education um, came because it seemed like an example of what is, um, goes wrong too often with school reform uh, in every generation. Namely, um, there's a problem, and the problem can be sort of widely agreed upon. Someone comes up with a simplistic, in the end it's simplistic, but it seems like a you didn't think of this, like TED Talk level solution, a silver bullet that's going to take away the problem. That was Lancaster's pattern. He said, we understand that these cities are bursting with young people without family money to pay tuition at schools. My solution will take care of that problem without costing a single dime. So yes, I admit it. When I started, I was wondering about the whole history of school reform. It seems like time and time again, you have, okay, there's a problem. Someone will say, I've got a solution that won't cost much and it'll solve everything. Hmm. It gets implemented and then people are like, hey, it doesn't really work. Um, and in, in, in this case, the thing that attracted me to the story in the first place was it seemed like the sort of prototype of that approach to school reform. There's the first big multi-city, multinational attempt to do that. And it followed that same pattern. Yeah, so we have a related question now from DeAndrews um, ask, asking whether you see the Lancasterian uh, system as being an early form of Turnerism. Oh, thank you. Yeah, definitely. One of the things that I keep wondering as I read and, you know, as I still keep reading is, um, oh, wait, I'm sorry. I was thinking Taylorism. <laughs> um, uh, so Turnerism, which Turner are we talking about? It's Quaker-driven efficiency in schools and industry. I was thinking about oh. Taylor in terms yeah. of assembly line method. So maybe, 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 maybe you all could take whichever one you think. Well, you if think. I can do Taylorism, then D, yeah. thank you, because um, uh, it's definitely this sort of 100 years before Taylor, everything in its place, a place for everything. Uh, as I mentioned with the hat bench, Lancaster seems... Uh, to my, you know, 21st century eyes, weirdly fascinated with these details of efficiency. So uh, you said, I was thinking uh, Taylor, because, uh, you know, Taylor was famous for the work, you know, efficient models. Mm -hmm. So was Lancaster. He had <clears throat> whistles, he had, um, you know, organized movement so that students would be the, as, as utterly efficient as possible. And his pitch was always that his schools were the most efficient because students were always working, whether they were a monitor or not, all the students would always be working as opposed to the old model. So yeah. uh, it was all about efficiency or, or one of the pitches was all about efficiency. Yeah, as, as I was listening to you give your talk, I kept thinking this really isn't somebody in the late 19th century because right? it feels so early for what it is. Mm -hmm. that, that, that emphasis on efficiency and really reducing the amount of um, practitioners you need in the classroom who are paid, I mean, stripping away all of those machineries. Um, so we have a question from uh, Zachary Diebel. Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. He said, earlier you stated that the cities of New York and Philadelphia had interest in setting up school systems around the Lancaster and model. How would information about models like these have reached the U.S.? Were there academic exchanges of educational theories between England and the rest of Europe and the U.S.? And if so, were there other prominent theories that were tried out to some extent, or was Lancaster's model particularly unique in the way that it was adopted in the U.S.? Uh, thanks, Zach. Uh, great question. Uh, well, the, the, um, the people, like, for example, Roberts Vox was one of the Philadelphia's um, leading elites. You know, he's like Bruce Wayne of the 18, early 1800s in Philadelphia. 
um, uh, he, I don't know what he did at night, uh, but he, he was this, you know, rich philanthropist. And he simply read everything from the London papers as well as the New York and the Boston papers. And Lancaster's uh, fame in London was just as well known um, in Philadelphia and New York as it was in, in Paris and St. Petersburg. Uh, now, Zach, you mentioned the international part. Um, one of the things that I've, I'm thinking as I start to get into the writing is I'm going to have to lose some of the global elements of Lancasterianism. It went global, it really did, um, so that there were Lancasterian societies, and as we've seen in Caracas, uh, but also in Mexico City, St. Petersburg, Paris, all over Europe. Uh, there were missionary Lancastrian schools uh, throughout India uh, and Africa. So how did it transfer? It, it worked a lot of ways. The first thing it did was because Lancaster himself, um, one of his first investments that he borrowed money for and didn't pay back was for a printing press. And he cranked out propaganda for his system and it went globally, including to the US. That's great. All right, so we've got a question from Ivan Juren. Hi there, Ivan. Um, was assessing student learning part of the Lancasterian system? Yeah, uh, thanks, Ivan. It was um, the, the, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that uh, Lancasterianism was attractive to as a replacement for something that we've largely lost. And that is a sort of um, examination type uh, evaluation method. So in, in the old method, uh, you would, students would silently read and then they would recite uh, from memory usually. And the, the teacher would listen and, and say, you know, oh, good or not good. Um, the, the evaluation uh, reform from the Lancastrian method was to take that role of the hearer and move it from a, a paid teacher to an unpaid student monitor. So what students would have to do was demonstrate. So for example, um, when those little kids were showing their slates, excuse me, they had to demonstrate that they had been able to write whatever they were supposed to write. When we saw that picture of the reading circles, a student would start, the top student would start reading. And if he or she got all the way through, then they moved on to something different. As soon as she made a mistake, the monitor said, eh, and she had to go to the end of the circle, the next student started. So the word that Lancaster used for this, and he treated it as if it was a magic invention of his own was emulation. By emulating, uh, students were supposed to get better and better. That was the sort of heart and soul of his uh, evaluation system. Hmm. Amanda Owens, uh, thanks you for a great lecture and asks, do you think it would be beneficial for current education classes to learn about Joseph Lancaster and his methods, even if they were wrong? Thanks. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for coming. Um, I, I absolutely do. Um, I think the one of the things that would be useful is what um, uh, Professor Neem started us off with. If we want to understand uh, ed reform, if we want to understand how schools work, um, we should learn, and not just in, in class, but we should learn in, um, say, uh, uh, public discussions of things like charter schools these days. We should be actively digging into this past so we don't end up doing uh, so often what we have so often done. We shouldn't leap onto a silver bullet reform and, and, and uh, history is full of them, not just Lancastrian education, but um, you know, nerds can, there's, there's a, a million different examples. So life adjustment education in the middle of the 20th century, for example, as the silver bullet reform or in the 1990s, you know, school choice and charter school as this silver bullet reform that can sort of solve this huge array of problems. So yes, Amanda, I think um, studying efforts that ended up not working is at least as important as sort of studying the roots of the things that did work. Hmm. You uh, mentioned offhand that he happened to be a, um, a Quaker. And it doesn't sound like a particularly good Quaker. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know uh, to what extent his, um, his, his Quakerism uh, influenced his pedagogy. Uh, to, it, well, he was a convert. So he wasn't raised a Quaker, but he joined. Mm -hmm. And he, um, <laughs> part, it, it, it was less pedagogical for him and more um, network. So for example, the people that brought him to New York were Quakers, Thomas Eddy, for mm -hmm. example. 
uh, and there were these Quaker philanthropic networks that were hugely influential oh, in London cool. and then in Philadelphia and then also in New York, not so much in Boston because uh, Boston was, had, was a little more rigid and didn't have as many Quakers in it. Um, but uh, less, uh, he, he was, a, as I say, he was a convert and he was an enthusiastic convert until he, until he quit. Um, and he would say that his Quakerism is what um, inspired him to realize that every child had, you know, this light to learn inside of him or her. Um, but he wasn't popular with the other Quakers generally because he um, uh, was seen as a sort of uh, religious sort of um, nouveau Quaker, you know, like they, mm -hmm. didn't, uh, they, 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 the, the network certainly supported his work as a charity, uh, but his pedagogy itself, he always claimed to be um, from his genius, not from his God. There is that, uh, that uh, humility we uh, would expect from a Quaker. Um, we have Mark Bunshoft here, who thanks you for his talk and says that you explained why black families grew disillusioned with the Lancasterian schools. Uh, but why were they drawn to them in the first place? If I'm not mistaken, John Teesman, the black principal teacher at NYAFS, was the first to try them in New York. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Wow, you know your stuff. Great. Um, right. the, 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 especially in New York, the African Free School, as it was called, is a really fascinating story because you have a very um, evident split in the African-American community in New York. You have um, uh, Dr. Teesman and other leaders who are pushing this as the thing for their community. So they hire, in fact, a prominent African-American minister to go door to door and you know, beg people to send their kids to the African free school. And for a variety of reasons, um, parents were reluctant. Um, one of the reasons was uh, the kids didn't like it. Um, they didn't like the punishments, but they also didn't like the, um, the sense that they were only gonna be taught just the basics, reading, writing. Um, at other schools, including schools by, by um, churches like the African, uh, like, sorry, the Episcopal Church. Students were, African-American students were taught a much more um, uh, rigorous sort of academic curriculum. So in the African-American community in New York, you see this real split. You see these African-American uh, leaders lamenting the, the community's lack of interest in this formal education. We don't know. I mean, the record doesn't show it directly as much what um, people who weren't writing and, and printing their, their thoughts were thinking, but we do know that they were keeping their kids away. Uh, so there's this tension there. So I'm gonna give the last question to Janine Hammer, who has a question about students and teachers, or sorry, students and parents. First of all, how did parents respond to the um, disciplinary process? Um, did they find it any kind of too, too severe or anything like that? And then in your research, did you find any feedback from students that was either complimentary or not? Yeah, so, and again, I wanna emphasize the, the things like the basket sound really harsh to us. Uh, Lancaster bragged about them, um, as did other Quakers, as a modern, was the word that they used, a modern type of uh, discipline that didn't rely on the rod. It didn't rely on, you know, getting um, beaten, uh, physically beaten. So, um, it was, it was uh, promoted as uh, not severe discipline. So um, it was, it was uh, something that the communities might not have liked. Well, and, and I guess the, the, the example that I use was maybe misleading because specifically in the New York African American community, you have writers like the um, editors of Freedom's Journal who are complaining that their kids in these schools are getting non-adult, non-expert teachers who treat their kids like they're dumb. So this is a, a sort of maybe not the same for all the students, not the same for white students. Um, uh, any feedback from the students? Oh, Janine, I, I have looked so long and so hard to find student responses. And I've dug up a few here and there. But uh, what I haven't been able to find is anything like a sort of uh, extensive uh, record of student responses. One thing that uh, is a beautiful um, uh, part of the library company's collection, though, uh, includes all these samples of student work, so work that they did in school. And yes, a lot of it is just, um, you know, very rote kind of work. But then there's also paintings, there's poetry. Um, so there's, 
there is a, a nice collection of student work out there and there's a smattering of letters from students saying, I love you. And then there's numbers of students who stopped coming. So it, it, it's iffy, but it's a great question. I wish I knew more. Well, thank you so much for your time, Adam. And um, I'm delighted to hear about this project before you even start writing it. Uh, mm. so this feels like a really privileged position right now to <laughs> work through these ideas. And I'm glad that we were all able to uh, share in this with you. So um, please do come back to the library company. Next time we'll do this in person. Um, and uh, next week, for those of you who are still tuned in, please join us same time, same place, your living room for Lauren Klein, who's going to discuss her latest book, hot off the presses of, I think it's University of Minnesota, an archive of taste, race and eating in the early United States. So with that, thank you all. Have a great evening. Thanks everybody. Take care. <laughs>